Good evening. Previously, I've attempted to do the McLeod Clinical Examination podcasts. However, they have been put on the back burner somewhat as we focused on releasing the latest 4K clinical skills examination videos. However, many people have asked if it's possible to do additional videos whereby I explain what particular signs are being looked for and any particular nuances which might be crucial to a certain examination performance. The former clouds chapters are quite considerable, so as a result they'll be subsplit into a history podcast where we're going to focus on all of the aspects of the conversation that you would expect to perform with a patient uh, coming in with various different symptoms in their presenting uh, complaint, also focusing to any particularly useful areas for clarification on a patient's past medical history, their drugs and allergy history, along with family and social histories. The second podcast slash audiobook thing will focus on the examination, how to perform it, and specifically what it is you're looking for. It might seem a bit strange to split things like this. However, what you must remember is that 90% of your diagnosis is made from the history. Your examination is only there to confirm what you think um, you already know from your history. As an example, if a patient has come in with what we think might be pleurisy, we would fully expect them to have a pleuritic rub when we do their respiratory examination. It is not the clinical examination which is where we're getting the main diagnosis. As a result of these requests, we've decided to make a slight variation to the way we're recording the McLeod's clinical examination podcasts, particularly that we'll be recording the appropriate chapter following the production of a clinical skills video. So in this case, I'm going back to those which have already been released and we're today going through uh, the respiratory examination. So, with that in mind, here is Chapter 5 of McLeod's Clinical Examination, The Respiratory System, as penned by J. Alastair Inns and James Tiernan, and now read by yours truly, James Gill. Anatomy and Physiology An understanding of the surface anatomy of the lungs and their relation to closely adjacent structures is essential for practice of respiratory medicine. At the end of tidal expiration, the dome of the diaphragm extends high into the thorax to around the level of the anterior end of the fifth rib, but slightly lower on the left. The lower anterior ribs therefore overlie the liver on the right and the stomach and spleen on the left, with the parietal pleura extending lower than the lungs on the lateral chest wall. Posteriorly, the lungs extend much lower, approaching the twelfth rib on full inspiration. The lung apex lies immediately beneath the brachial plexus, so apical lung tumours commonly disrupt T1 root fibres, causing pain and numbness in the interior aspect of the arm and wasting of the small hand of the muscles. This is one of the reasons why the respiratory examination and all other examinations start off with the hands. The upper thoracic sympathetic outflow, in the same way that the hands may be affected by respiratory pathologies, so can other regions of the body. The upper thoracic sympathetic outflow uh, to the eye may also be compromised, leading to a constricted pupil and ptosis. In the mid and lower mediastinum, Tumours can invade and compromise the pericardium, atria and the esophagus. In health, the lungs optimise gas exchange by closely matching the regional ventilation and perfusion. Airway and parenchymal lung diseases disrupt this matching, causing hypoxia and cyanosis, and commonly stimulate breathing through lung afferent nerves, leading to a history of breathlessness and tachynea on examination. The respiratory history. Patients use a wide range of terms to describe respiratory symptoms, such as infection, phlegm, catarrh, pleurisy, and wheeze. These can be ambiguous and require careful definition to avoid misunderstanding. Wheeze may be used when describing breathlessness, or I had a chest infection may denote a breathless episode actually due to a pulmonary embolism. 
As with other systems, the respiratory history should start with open questions, but should also specifically cover the below areas. Suspic respiratory symptoms being breathlessness, wheeze, cough, sputum slash hemoptysis, chest pain, fever, rigors, night sweats, weight loss, and sleepiness. In terms of past medical history, we should inquire about other respiratory diseases and all other illnesses and hospital encounters. Drug and allergy histories should include drugs causing or relieving respiratory symptoms, along with allergies to pollen, pets, dust, and obviously anaphylaxis. In a social and family history, we must make sure we have highlighted family history of respiratory disease, home circumstances, and the effect of and on disease, smoking, and an occupational history. To complete, we want the systematic review, whereby we will also check systemic diseases which may involve the lung, along with risk factors for lung disease. Common presenting symptoms of the respiratory system. Firstly, breathlessness. Breathlessness, or dyspnea, denotes the feeling of an uncomfortable need to breathe and is the most commonly reported respiratory symptom. It is also one of the most challenging to quantify, being inherently subjective. Breathlessness may originate from a respiratory or cardiac dysfunction, or may be a manifestation of psychological distress. Respiratory disease can cause breathlessness through a range of mechanisms. The stimulation of intrapulmonary afferent nerves by interstitial inflammation or thromboembolism, mechanical loading of respiratory muscles by airflow obstruction or reduced lung compliance in fibrosis, hypoxia due to ventilation slash perfusion mismatches stimulating chemoreceptors. Keeping in mind the subjective nature of shortness of breath or dyspnea, the Medical Research Council Breathlessness Scale is a useful and crucially validated way to document a patient's level of dyspnea formally. Specific questions may help distinguish the causes of breathlessness as well. The MRC Breathless Scale has from grade 1 to grade 5, indicating the degree of breathlessness related to particular activities with grade 1 being the least, whereby a patient would not be troubled by breathlessness except on strenuous exercise. Grade 2 would be shortness of breath when hurrying on the level or walking up a slight hill. Grade 3 walks slower than most people on the level, stops after a mile or so, or stops after 15 minutes of walking at their own pace. Grade 4 stops for breath after walking about 100 yards or so after a few minutes on level ground. And grade five is too breathless to leave the house or breathless when undressing. The benefit of the MRC uh, breathless scale means that you can discuss this with a patient. Frequently when taking a history, you will ask a patient about their breathlessness and they will respond very when you try to get additional information, such as how far they can walk, they will frequently respond with not very far at all. Whilst it is important to give the patient the ability to speak on their own, this information is obviously of very little use to the clinician, whereby highlighting the MRC breathlessness scale to the patient and discussing that with them may yield much more usable information. After formally assessing the breathlessness, it is important to find out additional information about the breathlessness. Specifically, how did the dyspnea come on? If the onset was spontaneous, that would lead you to think about a pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, or possibly an acute allergy. Onset over hours is typical in asthma, acute pulmonary edema, or acute infections. Whilst insidious onset occurs with developing effusions, interstitial diseases, and tumours. A good question to ask of the patient is how is their breathing at rest or overnight? This can be quite instructive for the underlying diagnosis. Asthma commonly wakes patients, whilst most patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 
COPD, are comfortable at rest and when asleep, but struggle with exertion. Breathlessness provoked by lying down, orthopnea, is a feature of heart failure, but also occurs frequently in patients with severe airflow obstruction or diaphragmatic weakness because the weight of the abdominal contents displaces the diaphragm towards the head on lying down, compromising the vital capacity. Anxiety is a big issue when cases of breathlessness, hence it can be very useful to explain why the patient may have difficulty breathing when they're lying flat because of their abdominal contents pressing on their chest, hence why they may find greater benefit from sitting propped up or having more pillows at night than would previously have been the case. Further questioning should ascertain whether or not a patient's breathing is normal on some days. Variable breathlessness is the hallmark of asthma, while consistent daily limitations are typical of COPD. Further questions which can be illuminating in the respiratory history would be, tell me something you would do in a day that would make you breathless, and the old standby of how far can you walk on a good day. Although as previously highlighted, this can be a difficult question in consultations. At all opportunities, record restrictions on normal activities or work and the corresponding MRC breathlessness score, as this may change over time. Find out when the breathlessness comes on. For example, asthma induced by exercise frequently appears only after the exercise and during early recovery because the sympathetic drive during exercise defends airway patency. Certain phrases in the history strongly suggest a psychological etiology of breathlessness, particularly phrases such as, I feel I can't get enough air or oxygen into my chest. In patients with hyperventilation due to anxiety, this symptom is frequently accompanied by a normal measured vital capacity. Associated symptoms induced by hypocapnia in hyperventilation include digital and periorbital paresthesia, lightheadedness, and sometimes chest tightness. A wheeze. Wheeze describes the high-pitched musical or whistling sounds produced by turbulent air flowing through small airways that have been narrowed by bronchospasm and or airway secretions. It is most commonly heard during expiration when the airway calibre is reduced. Wheeze must be distinguished from the rattling inspiratory and expiratory sounds caused by loose, mobile secretions in the upper airways and from the louder, dramatic croak of stridor caused by obstruction in the trachea or large airways. This is always a hugely important factor when dealing with a patient when a person says that they are hearing additional noises when they breathe. It is vital to determine whether or not we have the wheeze, that breathing noise on inspiration, or whether or not they're getting a sound on expiration. Any expiratory sound should be treated as a medical emergency until proven otherwise. Identifying the wheeze in a patient's history is very important as a true wheeze is typical of small airway diseases. It is most commonly associated with asthma and COPD, but may also occur with acute respiratory tract infections or with exacerbations of bronchiectasis, there due to a combination of airway narrowing and excessive secretions. When dealing with a wheeze, always ensure you ask the following questions. Is the wheeze worse? during or after exercise. If it occurs during exercise and limits it, this is suggestive of COPD. In asthma, as previously mentioned, the wheeze and tightness usually appears after the exercise. Do you wake with wheeze during the night? This would suggest asthma. Do you have hay fever or other allergies? Atopy is common in allergic asthma. A family history of wheeze, or asthma itself, is common in patients presenting with suspected asthma. 
Is it worse on waking in the morning and relieved by clearing of the sputum? In which case, this is seen frequently in COPD. Do you smoke? Smoking is suggestive of COPD, though patients with asthma occasionally smoke. Are there daily volumes of yellow or green sputum, sometimes with blood? This may suggest bronchiectasis, but keeping in mind that blood-stained sputum is always a clinical red flag and needs appropriate investigation. Cough. The cough reflex has evolved to dislodge foreign material and secretions from the central airways and may be triggered by pathology at any level of the bronchial tree. Inspiration is followed by an expiratory effort against a closed glottis. Sub subsequent opening of the glottis with rapid expiratory flow produces the characteristic sound. When dealing with a history of cough, ask about the duration of cough, whether it is present every day, whether a cough is intrusive or irresistible, or whether the patient coughs deliberately to clear a perceived obstruction or throat clearing, whether it produces sputum, if so, how much and what colour. Although it is worthwhile highlighting that, save for blood, the particular colour of the sputum is not indicative of any particular pathogens as previously was considered to be the case. Any triggers, such as during swallowing, in cold air, or during exercise, smoking, as this increases the likelihood of chronic bronchitis or lung cancer, associated clinical features, wheeze, may signal cough variant asthma, heartburn or reflux, may indicate gastroesophageal reflux, which commonly triggers a cough, altered voice or swallowing, consider laryngeal causes, and be aware that both of these will be considered red flags. Drug history, especially angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, which is the common cause of a dry cough, frequently noticed after taking the ACE inhibitor for a couple of months. A cough that is productive of green or yellow sputum frequently suggests a bronchial infection, Large volumes of sputum over long periods suggest bronchiectasis. Hemoptysis, a vital red flag, will be discussed in more detail in a moment. Cough is most commonly a symptom of acute viral upper respiratory tract infections. These are usually self-limiting over days to weeks. A cough that fails to settle over weeks may be the presenting feature of bronchial carcinoma. A history of smoking raises further suspicion of malignancy, although chronic cough is a non-specific symptom in smoking. Other investigations, including a chest x-ray, are often required to exclude an early cancer and should be considered in any smoker who has had a cough for longer than four weeks. A chronic cough is defined as a cough lasting more than eight weeks and can be debilitating both physically and socially. There are a handful of conditions which should be considered as differentials when dealing with a chronic cough. If we were dealing with airway problems, we'd be considering asthma, particularly a cough variant asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, persistent airway reactivity following acute bronchitis, and possibly bronchiectasis, which would be high indicated by daily purulent sputum for long periods, pneumonia or whooping cough in childhood, and may have recurrent hemoptysis. Other causes of chronic cough may be lung cancer, particularly in smokers, and would be a worrying factor in pneumonia that fails to clear after four to six weeks. Rhinitis with a post-nasal drip which may also be shown with chronic sneezing, nasal blockage or discharge. Esophageal reflux, whereby a patient may complain of heartburn or regurgitation of acid after eating, on bending or lying down. Nocturnal 
as well as daytime reflux, may be able to trigger the cough. Drug effects, as discussed previously with patients on ACE inhibitors. Interstitial lung disease may have the presentation of a persistent dry cough, and when examining the chest, fine inspiratory crackles will be noted at the bases. And finally, an idiopathic cough, where we have a long history with no signs and negative investigations. Given the potential severe diagnosis of lung cancer in a chronic cough, an idiopathic cough should only be considered as a diagnosis of exclusion. In patients with malignancy at the left hilum, damage to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve may paralyse the left vocal cord, making it impossible for the patient to close the glottis and generate a normal explosive cough. The resulting hoarse forced expiration without the initial explosive glottal opening is termed a bovine cough and is an important symptom warning of possible hyalurt malignancy. Now we turn to sputum production. In health, the airway lining fluid coating the tracheobronchial tree ascends the mucociliary escalator to the larynx, where it mixes with the upper respiratory tract secretions and saliva and is then swallowed. In acute or chronic airway infection, accumulation of neutrophils, mucus and proteinaceous secretions in the airway results in a cough with the expiration of sputum. Ask about the characteristics of sputum to consider the pathology. A change in colour or consistency or an increase in volume may indicate a new infection in chronic disease. When dealing with colour, again, I highlight that a particular organism would not be indicated by any specific colours. However, we can still get additional information from the colour of a sputum. Clear or mucoid sputum may suggest COPD or bronchiectasis without current infection slash rhinitis. Yellow or mucopurulent would suggest an acute lower respiratory tract infection or potentially asthma. Green or purulent sputum suggests a current infection, acute disease or an exacerbation of chronic disease such as COPD. Red or brown, also known as rusty sputum, may indicate pneumococcal pneumonia but you should try to distinguish between rusty and frank red blood. Pink, serous or frothy may indicate an acute pulmonary edema. We also want to find out about the volume of sputum, particularly establish the amount produced over 24 hours. Small amounts into a tissue or enough to fill a spoon, egg cups or an egg. Compare the current volume with the patient's baseline or normal minimal volume. Consistency of sputum. An increase in thickness, viscosity, may indicate exacerbation in bronchiectasis. Large volumes of frothy secretions over weeks or months are a feature of the uncommon bronchoalveolar cell carcinomas. Occasionally, sputum is produced as firm plugs by a patient with asthma sometimes indicating an underlying allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Now the most worrying sign in terms of features of a cough, hemoptysis. Hemoptysis means coughing up blood from the respiratory tract. It can complicate any severe forceful cough, but it is most commonly associated with acute and chronic respiratory tract infections. Hemoptysis may also indicate pulmonary embolism and lung cancer. Never assume hemoptysis has a benign cause until serious pathology has been considered and excluded. Ask about how it appeared, how much blood there was, and whether there are any associated features, and over what time period it came on. Questions with regarding hemoptysis would be as follows. Was the blood definitely coughed from the chest? Blood in the mouth may be vomited or may have come from the nose in epicastaxis 
or may appear on chewing or toothbrushing in patients with gum disease. A short history of streaks of blood with purulent sputum suggests acute bronchitis. A sudden episode of small volume of blood with a pleuritic pain and breathlessness suggest pulmonary embolism. Recurrent streaks of blood in clear sputum should prompt a search for lung cancer. Recurrent blood streaks in purulent sputum over weeks suggest possible TB or cancer with infection. Over years, they may suggest bronchiectasis. Larger volumes of hemoptysis, specifically greater than 20 millilitres, suggest specific causes, those being lung cancer eroding a pulmonary vessel, bronchiectasis, such as cystic fibrosis, cavitatory lung disease, such as bleeding into an aspergilloma, pulmonary vasculitis, and pulmonary arteriovenous malformations. Stridor. This harsh grating respiratory sound is caused by the vibration of the walls of the trachea or major bronchi when the airway lumen is critically narrowed by compression, tumour or inhaled foreign material. The inspiration lowers the pressure inside the extrathoracic trachea so critical narrowing here leads to the inspiratory stridor. In contrast, the intrathoracic large airways are compressed during expiration by positive pressure in the surrounding lung, leading to the fixed expiratory wheeze or stridor. Large airway narrowing at the thoracic inlet, for example trachea compression by a large goiter, may cause both inspiratory and expiratory stridor. Rapid investigation and treatment are vital when this sign is present. As a GP, it's not unusual to come across a patient with an inspiratory wheeze. These patients, if severe, are normally put on a nebulizer or use more of their salbutamol inhaler whilst in the practice. However, a stridor is always going to be a worrying sign. As briefly indicated above, there can be a vast range of conditions leading to that stridor. So a goiter, if you've got problems with your thyroid directly pressing over the trachea, if we've got food um, stuck in the trachea, or if we've got tumours pressing on the trachea, all of these are going to be significantly worrying features, as a result of which I'd be very, very strongly inclined to get urgent assistance and review of the patient rather than discharging them home for further investigations. Now that might seem a little bit overcautious, but we have just identified that a stridor is due to an airway obstruction of some form. Thus, I want to know what is going on to make sure both the patient and myself can sleep well at night. If we want to boil it down really to brass tacks, if something obstructs your airway, you've got about two minutes before the brown stuff really hits the fan. And in that situation, I want the patient in a location where they can be effectively managed which is not going to be in a GP surgery. So moving on, what additional um, symptoms do we have? A patient might complain of chest pain. Chest pain may originate from musculoskeletal, respiratory, cardiovascular, or gastroesophageal reflux diseases. In which case, make sure that you establish the site and severity of chest pain. What's the character of the chest pain? Sharp pain, for example, would suggest a pleural pain. What is the onset? Has it been gradual or rapid? Exacerbating or relieving factors. Worsening with cough or deep breaths suggests, again, pleural disease. And any associated symptoms. Breathlessness, fever, cough, all suggest an infective cause. With any pain, we can use the squitas mnemonic to guide us in our history taking. Squitas, S-Q-I-T-A-S, standing for sight, quality, intensity, timing, aggravating and relieving factors, and symptoms associated. It doesn't matter how long you have been graduated from medical school, you're still going to fall back on that simple squitas um, acronym in almost daily use. So continuing on with the concept of chest pain, a large pulmonary embolus can cause angina-like chest pain. 
This is due to increased right ventricular work together with the reduced coronary oxygen delivery caused by hypotension and hypoxemia, resulting in right ventricular ischemia. Kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you've got a massive plug sitting in one of the blood vessels of your lungs, that's going to have a huge impact on how much blood is actually going to pass through the lungs and get oxygenated. Do not forget that you cannot get, inverted commas, lung pain, as pain does not originate in the lung parenchyma or the visceral pleura, as these only have autonomic nerve supplies. Pain that is considered to be from the lungs is essentially pleuritic pain, and this is worse on inspiration and coughing, and is usually described as sharp, stabbing, or knife-like. It's usually sighted away from the midline and may be localised or affect a wide area of the chest wall. There are several diseases which are acknowledged to cause parietal pleural pain. Let's have a look at a few of those now. Pulmonary embolisms or pulmonary infarct and pneumonia can cause parietal pain in the same way. This is either from direct pleural inflammation the way I've thought about that with pulmonary embolisms in the past is you literally have a small infarct. You've got an area of death to the lung. That causes swelling, and in doing so, you get that direct pleural inflammation around the area of the infarct. You also have adhesions with pleural traction occurring on respiratory movement in pneumonia and pulmonary emboli, both of which are going to give you a source of pain. A pneumothorax is a major cause of pleural chest pain. Here you have mechanical distortion of the pleura with the lung collapsing. And finally, and most obviously, lung cancer. Here the pleura is simply distorted by infiltration of the cancer, although the pain there tends to be more constant um, in lung cancer patients rather than purely on inspiration. Musculoskeletal chest pain is common and can occur with chest trauma, forceful coughing, or connective tissue disease. The chest is characteristically tender to local palpation and pain can be reproduced by respiratory movements and or movement of the spine or shoulder muscles. Frequently, I have patients, particularly the younger ones who come in saying that they have chest pain and they're worried that they may be having a heart attack or having significant internal pathology. If you're able to press on the chest wall and cause the chest pain they've been complaining of, then it's frequently the case that everybody in the room can relax. A detailed history of events preceding chest pain is obviously vital as an injury can be easily overlooked by the patient on their initial presentation. Two other common conditions which can cause acute chest pain would be Borholm disease, an infection with an enterovirus, specifically Coxsackie B, which causes an acute but self-limiting inflammation of the intercostal muscles. Then episodes of unilateral severe stabbing myalgia or muscle pain may develop over an intercostal space and settle after a few days. A very common diagnosis is costochondritis, also Tietze syndrome, when costal swelling is present. This is an idiopathic inflammation of the costal chondral cartilages adjoining the sternum and can cause acute localised pain and tenderness. Thankfully, the pain settles there with simple analgesia and the passage of time will ease both of these conditions. However, in clinical medicine, it is vital that you explain this fact to the patient and what the underlying pathological process is, otherwise you will unlikely alleviate their fears and result in them returning once more. Herpes zoster infection, or shingles, may start with a superficial itch or burning pain in a thoracic dermatome, which is then followed by the appearance of a vesicular rash. Pain and altered sensation may present long after the rash is resolved, often with scarring in the said dermal distribution. Burning, retrosternal pain may indicate esophagitis, but this can also occur with myocardial ischemia. Alteration of discomfort after eating or antacids helps distinguish esophageal pain and cardiac pain, which we'll come into in a later podcast. 
In terms of esophagitis, I myself have had this, and I think the best way of describing it is as if someone has taken a lightsaber, pushed it through your chest, and wiggled it around. I was using a medication, doxycycline, whilst on my elective in Africa, and unfortunately was not taking the medication quite as advised, and had occasionally missed breakfast whilst taking my anti-malarial tablets. As a result, I developed, as mentioned, the severe retrosternal burning pain of esophagitis, and can contest that even drinking fluids is very painful in those situations. Central, constant, progressive, non-pleuritic chest pain may represent mediastinal disease, particularly malignancies. Similarly, chest wall pain without trauma that is constant, progressive and non-pleuritic may suggest chest wall invasion by a malignancy. Pain-induced sleep disturbance is also a feature of malignant pains and is a very worrying sign. What you have to think about is that at night, your natural levels of cortisol, an inflammatory steroid hormone, dip. If you have a bony tumour or an invasion of malignancy, at night, the natural levels of your own steroids, your anti-inflammatories, will reduce, allowing the tumour to swell. If that tumour is in a bone or in a small volume area, that swelling will cause intense pain, causing pain-induced sleep disturbance. Pain-induced sleep disturbance, or simply night pain, is a major red flag. Fevers, rigors, and night sweats. These symptoms are not specific to respiratory medicine, but are commonly reported by patients with respiratory diseases. Infection, be it acute or chronic, is the usual cause, but other etiologies, such as lung cancer, lymphoma, or vasculitis, also must be considered. Patients use a range of terms to describe fevers, such as shivers, chills, being hot and bothered, having the shakes. In my practice, I've recently had someone describe it to me as having the agues, or agos. So when a patient is providing you with terminology that you do not understand, ensure they ask for a detailed explanation of their symptoms, and perhaps an alternate word use. The way I've always thought about it is if a patient tells you something you would not be able to explain to another person, you need to find out more information or ask them to clarify what they mean with that word. Rigors are generalised, uncontrollable episodes of vigorous body shaking lasting a few minutes. Despite high fever, the patient may complain of feeling cold and seeking extra clothing. Rigors usually indicates a bacterial sepsis, lobe pneumonia, and acute pyonephritis as the most common causes. They can be misinterpreted as a seizure, but the retention of consciousness and the associated pyrexia would suggest rigors. Night sweats are more closely associated with chronic infection, such as tuberculosis, and malignancy or lymphoma, rather than acute infections. Occasional episodes of a sweaty head or a pillow are inconclusive, but if the patient reports having to change their night clothes or sheets frequently due to profuse nocturnal sweating over several weeks, this is more likely to indicate an underlying disease. It's very, very common for me to see in a surgery a patient saying, oh, I've got terrible night sweats, and it is vital that you get that clarification. If a patient isn't having to change their bed sheets or pyjamas, at least nightly, because the sweating, because they're wet through, it's highly unlikely that we're looking at a significant problem, and I would be inclined to reassure them at that point. Weight loss. Weight loss is a common feature of several important respiratory diseases. Lung cancers, chronic infective diseases such as tuberculosis and bronchiectasis, and diseases causing chronic breathlessness, such as COPD and interstitial lung disease. The pathophysiology of weight loss is complex. However, breathlessness is associated with a diminished appetite, and the systemic inflammatory responses are also thought to contribute to weight loss. I'm sure we've all been there, you've had the flu, you're in bed, you're hot, you're sweaty, and you don't want to eat. 
Small amounts of weight loss also occur in acute infection due to, as mentioned, that consequent loss of appetite, particularly during hospitalisation. Although in my own experience, I haven't found the hospital food to be particularly appetising, but we'll leave that be. Ask the patient to estimate the extent and duration of weight loss and inquire about appetite and dietary intake. Being underweight is a poor prognostic indicator in any chronic respiratory disease. Recently, I've read a couple of studies which have suggested that that is more than chronic respiratory disease, but is actually for any hospital admission. Obviously, being overweight is not good for your health. However, there is some suggestion that those who are of a slighter build tend to have worse outcomes on long-term hospital admissions. Sleepiness. Excess daytime sleepiness may be a symptom of an underlying sleep-related breathing disorder, such as obstructive sleep apnea or sleep hypernea. In these conditions, frequent episodes of upper airway obstruction at night cause repeated microarousals from sleep, leading to complete disruption of the normal sleep cycle. Daytime somnolence impairs work and driving performance, causing dangers to the patient and others. If you're concerned about excess sleepiness, you must make sure you ask about normal sleeping habits. Does the patient keep hours that are normal to allow rest? Do they have shift or night work? as this can disrupt and prevent healthy sleeping patterns. Does the patient wake refreshed, or do they wake exhausted? Sleep apnea patients tend to be exhausted in the morning. Have they struggled to stay awake in the day, for example at work or when driving? It's vital to advise cessation of driving pending investigations if obstructive sleep apnea is suspected. This can be a particularly difficult consultation. Ideally, seek a description of any nighttime breathing disturbance from a bed partner. In obstructive sleep apnea, the patient may observe periodic cessation of breathing, accompanied by increased respiratory efforts, followed by a sudden and loud resumption of breathing, often with postural repositioning, then repetition of this cycle. Validated sleepiness scores, such as the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, can be used to quantify daytime somnolence and are helpful if considering referral to a sleep disorder clinic. That pretty much wraps up our history of presenting complaints for respiratory patients. Now let's look at some of the specifics we would want to find out about in their past medical history. Past illnesses, which may surprisingly be related to respiratory problems, are as follows. Eczema or hay fever, due to an allergic tendency which might turn into um, asthma. Childhood asthma. Many wheezy children do not have asthma as adults, yet many adults with asthma had a childhood wheeze. So looking backwards may give us an idea about what's going on in the present. Whooping cough, um, measles, or an inhaled foreign body. All of these are recognised causes of bronchiectasis, especially if complicated by pneumonia. Pneumonia, obviously, um, is going to have a significant impact on a patient's respiratory system going forwards, as will pleurisy. Both of these are again recognised causes of bronchiectasis, and recurrent episodes may actually be the manifestation of bronchiectasis. It won't be a surprise to anybody to know that a past history of tuberculosis may put a patient at risk of other respiratory problems, particularly the TB returning. If a patient has not previously been fully treated or treated effectively, reactivation can be quite common. It's also worthwhile finding out what treatments that they had at the time, as respiratory failure may be a complication of thoracoplasty. Mycetoma in the lung cavities may also present with hemoptysis. Any of the connective tissue disorders, for example rheumatoid arthritis, may have an impact on the lungs. Lung diseases are recognised complications of connective tissue disorders, for example pulmonary fibrosis, effusions, again bronchiectasis, 
Are you beginning to get the feeling that bronchiectasis is probably one of those conditions that is worthwhile putting a lot of uh, attention to for your respiratory revision? Immunomodulatory treatments for connective tissue disorders may cause pulmonary toxicity or render patients susceptible to respiratory infections as we cause suppression of the immune system. If a patient has had previous malignancy, whether or not it is in the lungs or otherwise, recurrence is always going to be a problem, as could be metastatic or pleural disease. Some cancers are known to be more likely to spread or develop secondaries to the lungs than other areas. These include what are euphemistically termed the B-type cancers, so that being bowel, breast, bladder, testicles or balls, and bidney. Yeah, kidney, we're kind of straining the metaphor there. There are other areas, such as the stomach, the esophagus, melanomas and sarcomas which are known to spread commonly to the lungs. In fact, up to 50% of lung cancers are thought to be related to um, metastasis rather than the primary in its own right. Recent surgery or loss of consciousness puts a patient at risk of respiratory issues due to potential aspiration of foreign bodies or in the case of surgery, potential gastric contents. Pneumonia and lung abscesses are also a risk if anything ends up in the respiratory tree which shouldn't be there. Another major area of potential um, problems for the respiratory system is neuromuscular disorders. If a patient has weakness of their chest wall muscles, that is going to vastly increase the risk of aspiration, as has been said, as a patient may not be able to cough with full force in order to bring about uh, expiration or removal of a foreign body. Similarly, as the chest wall muscles weaken, respiratory failure is also of high risk. As you've seen, a past medical history must include respiratory diseases that might reoccur or cause long-term symptoms, and disease in other symptoms which may cause, complicate or present with respiratory problems. Also to be considered will be thrombotic, cardiovascular, hematological, obviously malignancies and connective tissue diseases. Note that prior respiratory treatments, including the need for critical care and the degree of chronic symptoms, such as usual exacerbation frequency, antibiotic prescription rate and previous hospitalizations are vital bits of information for documentation. Drug and allergy history. Note all drugs that a patient is currently using, including inhalers, nebulized bronchodilators, and domiciliary oxygen, non-prescription remedies and recreational drugs. Cross-check the drug names and doses with a separate source if possible, such as the general practitioner's records. Drugs given for other problems commonly cause respiratory side effects. Here's an overview of the symptoms which drugs may cause and those particular causative agents. Bronchoconstriction could be due to beta blockers, opioids or non steroidal anti-inflammatories. As a result, these three types of medication should always be avoided in asthmatics. Cough can be produced by an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Bronchiolitis obliterans can be due to penicillamine. Diffuse parenchymal lung disease has a range of potential triggering drugs, particularly cytotoxic agents such as bleomycin and methotrexate, anti-inflammatory agents such as sulfasalazine, penicillamine again, gold salt and aspirin, cardiovascular drugs such as amiodarone or hydralazine, antibiotics such as nitrofurantoin, and intravenous drug misuse. Pulmonary embolisms may be triggered by estrogens, as may pulmonary hypertension, which is one of the reasons why pill checks do require you to clarify that there has been no history of DVTs, either personally or in the family, and as an obvious extension of that, that they have not had any issues with pulmonary blood clots either. Pulmonary effusions may be seen in amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, phenytoin, methotrexate, and pergolide. And finally, respiratory depression can be caused by opioids and benzodiazepines. 
As I'm sure you can see from that little list, there are certain medications which keep returning as problems for respiratory patients. Particularly, I'd highlight the beta blockers, um, amiodarone from cardiovascular drugs, and nitrofentone along with estrogens. These are medications which are frequently used in day-to-day -day practice and thus should be considered whether or not their prescription is likely to cause problems for a patient. As with any patient, it is always vital to ask and record whether or not the patient has any known allergies. Firstly, as allergic asthma is far more common in those who have a history of atopy, but also specify whether or not the patient has any specific drug allergies that they are aware of, and if they are aware of any, ensure that you document what that allergic reaction was, whether or not it was a rash, or whether or not the patient had full-blown anaphylaxis. Personally, I like to ensure that the requirement to check for allergies and drug allergies is rigorously drummed into my students. What you have to remember is that as a student, you have the potential to save a patient's life by ensuring that they are not given the incorrect drugs if you have the information about their drug allergies. Actually, I'd perhaps go a little bit further and consider failure to ask drug allergies when you are arranging a patient's management should be a trigger for an automatic fail event during examinations. But then again, when it comes to exams, I am a little bit of a hawk. Family history should be considered a crucial area as well of a respiratory patient's history. Ask about family history of asthma, although this is common in the population and therefore might not be highly predictive. Respiratory diseases with a known genetic cause are also relatively rare. Most patients with cystic fibrosis may have unaffected carrier parents, but may have affected siblings. I find cystic fibrosis one of those very interesting conditions because in Europe we have a high prevalence of carriers. The reason being it's thought that carrier status may have provided some evolutionary benefit in terms of protection against diseases or illnesses causing diarrhea and dehydration in the past, such as cholera or dysentery. Social history. Always start by identifying the patient's normal level of daily activity and the impact of their recent symptoms on this. Can they still manage their work, their self-care, and any caring that they themselves have to deliver to others? What are a patient's home circumstances, i.e. are they limited by their chronic respiratory conditions and then may become confined to their own homes? This particularly might be the case if they become too breathless to manage stairs. Always ask a patient about their home environment and what support they receive, if any, in order to enable them to function. Smoking, this is an utterly vital part of the respiratory history. Obtaining an honest and accurate history of tobacco use is difficult, but can be achieved with a good rapport with the patient. Ask if others smoke in the house as well, as this can be a major obstacle to bringing about smoking cessation. Remember to also inquire about the use of cannabis and e-cigarettes. An occupational history is normally very illuminating on a respiratory history. Many respiratory diseases are caused by occupational or domestic exposure to inhaled substances. Common examples may be a coal miner who is exposed to coal dust, then putting them at risk of progressive pulmonary fibrosis or coal workers' pneumoconiosis. Certain factory workers, such as paint sprayers, bakers and joiners, may be at risk of asthma due to exposure of isocyanates, flour and wood dust. Similarly, distillers may actually be exposed to aspergillosis in malt and thus potentially at risk of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This condition is also a risk for farmers and labourers who might be exposed to fungal spores in mouldy hay. If we are concerned that potential employee exposure has occurred and may be impacting on their respiratory health, it is useful to record an employer's name, the dates and duration of exposures, and whether any personal protective equipment or masks were offered and used. 
To wrap up, we should do a systemic inquiry asking about any risk factors such as malignancy for thromboembolism. The remaining history may reveal previously unsuspected pathologies presenting with respiratory symptoms or complicating respiratory illnesses such as ovarian malignancy presenting as a pleural effusion. That pretty much wraps up our overview of respiratory history and the particularly important features that we would need to inquire about. I'm going to be recording the next section of the respiratory examination, that being the physical examination and how we go about doing the examination and what we're going to be looking for. I'd be really grateful if um, people have any comments or feedback before I get round to um, that recording so that I might uh, tweak things and hopefully make this a better learning experience for the listeners. One of the things that I am aware of is that just the history itself is currently ticking over at 55 minutes. So I'm not sure whether or not um, this could be cut down further or whether or not you're happy with the detail in order to be able to pause and drop in and drop out as um, the listener prefers. Either way, if you could put some information about your preferences in the comments, I'd be massively grateful to you. Thank you very much in advance. Take care. Bye bye.